Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Set Report. I'm your host, Devin Decker. I'm joining me, my host companion, and the Pooh by Frazier. Season How are you doing, Season? I'm doing okay. I'd rather not be listening to a mouthful of food. What's uh, what's going on over there, Dev? Any reason why you just started eating breakfast as soon as you hit record? <laughs> I know, especially since we got delayed. Oh, Sejim, it's not just any breakfast. That's a Taco Bell rolled chicken taco. Uh, fantastic. You know, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> so they're actually not available at every Taco Bell. Did you know that? It's not surprising, considering yeah, I was hunting they... down McDonald's curly fries this weekend and then found out that's only in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, oh, hold on. How did you even get in, like, on a promotion for, for Filipino McDonald's? What are... I have no idea. I woke up and saw... Curly fries are back at McDonald's. And I'm like, oh my God, that sounds incredible. And I'm like, oh, maybe they're not in this area. Maybe they're just testing them at another location. And then like digging, digging, digging. Oh, it's only in the Philippines. Okay. Well, thanks for that. (laughs) Did this just get picked up on the radio signals you get in your teeth or something? Like, (laughs) it was online. It was just like an online thing that I got. Oh, man. Mm. Can't trust the internet, man. You, you cannot trust the internet. Oh, man. Sorry. It's been four years since the rolled chicken taco was available, and they're back. They were actually back last week, but I, I wanted to save it for this week so we could call this the return of the rolled chicken taco report, plus the task <laughs> and everything. It all kind of synergized really nicely. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> But what do you mean they're not available everywhere? Have you been able to partake of the favored food stuff of the Say Report? So I did find them eventually, yes, but but not at my usual Taco Bell spot. I was uh, uh, I mentioned that I was looking for Taco Bell chicken ta- rolled chicken tacos, and they weren't at my Taco Bell for some reason. And somebody was kind enough to fill me in that they were available at one out in Salt Lake, so I, did, I was able to go out and get them. But uh, but yeah, I had to I had to make a special trip just for this. Well, I'm hopeful. I hope it went better than my trip that I made this morning to pick up the rolled chicken taco that I was just eating, because I wanted to have them available for all of the activities for today. So I ordered four four packs. Now, if you've listened back to other episodes, you should not eat more than four rolled chicken tacos at a time. Uh, they're not just for me; they are for people that I'm hanging out with later today. And they gave me four rolled chicken tacos instead of the 16 that I ordered. <laughs> Whoa. And I didn't find out till I was back home. So I've already called the restaurant and they assure me that if I go back later today, I can get the other 12 that I am owed. They gave me all See, the I, sauces, it sounds, though. It sounds so. to me like they were just doing you a favor, man. Like, you don't want to eat rolled chicken tacos that have just been sitting in your friend's basement for the last... <laughs> Well, the last three hours. you know, I just brought, I would have just brought down the one that I did for the opening season. The rest <laughs> would have sat in the refrigerator. <laughs> but yeah, so that was my thing. But I still got it. Dale and I each were able to have two for breakfast. And now I'm here recording. But I've been dealing a lot with that limited time. I guess it's September. Kind of kicks off limited time fast food offerings in the world. <laughs> Well, you know, it's Oscar season and everybody wants to get it out there for the award. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you son of a bitch. More like Grimace season if we're talking about fast food specials. Uh, but yeah, so Wendy's is supposed to have a, a pumpkin spice frosty. Right, and they yeah. were supposed to come out, I think Tuesday was the day that they were supposed to release. So the 12th, was that the 12th? That sounds right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So September 12th, this was supposed to come. So I go to my Wendy's that I go to for breakfast figuring, oh, you know what, I'll get the, they also have a cold brew with the Spice Pumpkin Frosty Cream. Have you tried their cold brew coffee that they use Frosty as the dairy in? Because it's kind of weird. Yeah, I was going to say, I have not. I did not know that they were doing this, and somebody should go in there and stop them immediately. So they don't put the <laughs> Now that cold... I know, I'm going to go in and tell them no. The craziest thing about it is, so a Frosty machine 
is kind of just a soft serve machine. Mm-hmm. Kind of. Like, no, there's... No, not to blow anybody's mind, but... Uh... <laughs> but the formula that they use to make it, it's a little bit different than the dairy that you pour into a soft serve machine. I know that because I've actually seen the two syrups and compared them. Cause... Is it like... <sighs> Is it like um, Dairy Queen rules where they actually, in order to get around like certain rules, they have actually eliminated like 97% of the dairy in their in their soft serve? That's why it's not technically soft serve. It's, um, what do they call it? I don't know what they call it at DQ. The, yeah, I forget what they call it at DQ. Oh, a um, blizzard, right? Or what, no, that's not that's the, the thing. Blizzard is I forget is, what the, yeah. what it is. But they but there's like a there's like a type of of uh, ice cream that they serve that is so not cream that they can get away with like basically not having to follow certain like milk fat laws or something like that. Um, <laughs> which and it sounds like that's what Wendy's is is like trying to attempt here with the frosty. Yeah, it's also they're like a unique sort of flavoring and the it's like it's kind of like ice nine if you're like a big vonnegut fan nice <laughs> but nice um, it's like a different way of of mixing it together whatever that is i think it might mm-hmm. be more milk based i'm not 100 percent sure but it is different and then they pour that and they only had the chocolate frosty for like ever like that's what a frosty was was a chocolate drink was a chocolate treat and then they introduced okay. the vanilla, and now they've introduced the strawberry, and now finally, I don't know if they've had any along the way, but like in what I've witnessed, they now have the pumpkin spice. <laughs> uh, and so that's the thing. But what they do is, rather than the cold, chilled one from the machine, when you get the cold brew coffee with frosty cream, it is the stuff that they put into the machine to make the frosty that is put into your coffee. That's it's, how they do it. It's kind of crazy. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> like, does it taste like frosty? Like, like <laughs> obviously, because to me, they're like, here's the thing, I, I, and I think this is kind of what you, what you were getting at when you were trying to explain what a frosty is. The most important factor of a frosty is not the flavor, right? It is, it is the texture. It is like that is like their that is that is even what they sell the frosty on right is like they're like you need a spoon and a straw like not that there's not a million other things that you eat like that but like there's but this idea that that when i want a frosty over any other type of of iced product of any kind uh, the reason i want a frosty in particular is because of the texture so to remove that element from it and just say we're just putting the syrup in coffee now is like so far removed from what I care about or frosty that at that point, like, no, thank you. I don't, don't need you to do that. Like who, like, I, I, who discovered this? Did somebody trip and fall and accidentally put the, the, the so, okay. So the now machine one day, here we are for, according to Wendy's, uh, Thomas, Dave Thomas wanted a dessert that was a mixture of thick milkshake and fluffy, creamy, soft serve ice cream. And that's exactly what he made with the frosty. The consistency and texture are the key difference between a traditional milkshake and a frosty. The frosty was designed to be thick enough to use a spoon, smooth enough to use a straw and perfect when enjoyed on the end of a fry. Uh, the two things that continue to contribute to the frosty thickness is the temperature and the ingredients. Treats are served between 19 degrees and 21 degrees Fahrenheit and ensuring they'll stay thick. And the ingredients are really what keep the dessert thick. So while it includes fresh milk, cream, sugar, and cocoa, the actual list of ingredients from the frosty menu page, this is the say report. We are literally the show about everything. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Thank you, All Recipes pop-up ad. Uh, not a sponsor. Also, Taco Bell is not a sponsor, even though we started with talking about them. Milk, sugar, corn syrup, cream, whey, non-fat dry milk, cocoa, guar gum, mono and diglycerides, cellulose glum, natural vanilla flavor, carrageenan, calcium sulfate, sodium citrate, dextrose, and vitamin A palmitate. Now the oh, guar yeah. gum and the cell so hungry. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, but it's, it's that guar gum, cellulose gum, carrageenan and calcium sulfate, those are like the ingredients that make things thick and smooth. Right. And and calcium sulfate prevents it from melting. So yeah, so I don't know. But yeah, you get a you get a cold brewed coffee 
which I don't know if you've tried Wendy's coffee. It's supposed to be very good. And they put frosty cream in it, but that's not been chilled through the machine. I would like to think that all their food is supposed to be very good, but whether or not it comes out the other end that way is up for debate. No, I mean, like, actual critics have said that they've they've delivered a pretty good cup of coffee, mm -hmm. as opposed to, like, the mud you might get at a, a, like, a local diner that's been sitting around all day. You know what, first of all, never knock diner coffee. But I you love know what, diner what, coffee. What, what just... makes me, yeah, but you know what really makes me buy this, actually, like, like what I, why I honestly believe this? Um, because Wendy's is still the only fast food place I know of that still gets a gathering of, of old folks every morning. You know, like, when I was a kid, I remember that, like, that used to be a thing at, like, every place. Like, every place had their, like, morning early bird crew that would show up by breakfast and hang out for a few hours because, you know, people, older people need something to do with their lives, I guess. And um, and there wasn't much to do in the 90s, I guess. But nowadays, I don't, like, I don't see that in McDonald's. I don't see that in, in Burger King's. But I do see that still at Wendy's. Every morning, there is a, there is a flock of old people that just hang out in that Wendy's by us. Uh, the, the closest I've seen is at the bad McDonald's, the blacklisted McDonald's, because there are two McDonald's close by, and let's not go to that one, let's go to the good one. Uh, right. That one will have the guys, and they hang out outside eating the breakfast, which to me says these guys were doing this indoors, and then McDonald's was like, no, you can't sit in here all day just because you ate a fucking McMuffin. <laughs> and it's like... Oh, okay, because it's so full of people, you know, McDonald's. But it's nice. Yeah. To, I like when I drive by and I see those guys sitting there eating and shooting the shit in the parking lot. I think that's very, like, I understand what you're talking about. And I look forward to being an eccentric old guy who gets to do that. Being yeah, a man of a certain out. age. <laughs> like this oh, show, man. man of a certain age. But yeah, so I go to my local, this, this whole story, like this is all detour from the initial story. I go to the Wendy's I usually stop at for breakfast because it's on the way to work. And it looked like it was abandoned or condemned. Like, you know how sometimes you look at a building and there's just no life in it? That yes. is what the Wendy's looked like at 8 in the morning. <laughs> and they're supposed to open at 6. So I'm like, oh, I know something happened here. <laughs> Yeah. Like, what? I don't know. I'm going to step back. I've seen it open since, so maybe it was just, we're going to let you guys sleep in because it's pumpkin spice frosty day, and we know what the rush is going to be like. So You animals, stay back. Stay back. We only have enough for 250 cups today. Yeah. <clears throat> so I say, all right, I'm going to stop by the Wendy's close to home, and I'll pick one up there. And I'll also still try the cold brew coffee. Because I want to I wanna try it, and what better excuse than the fact that it's made with the, the pumpkin spice. So I place my mobile order. I go through, and they say, I get to the window, and he's like, yeah, we don't got the pumpkin spice frosty. I go, oh, okay. Well, I, I'm going to order that online. It's fine. He's like, what do you want instead? I'm like, I'll just take a chocolate frosty. And he hands me two chocolate frosties when I just ordered the one. So I'm thinking, oh, okay. So they, they don't have the pumpkin cold brew either, so he just gave me two Frosties. So then I get the rest of my food, right? Because I'm like, the dinner's going to be Wendy's tonight. I'll be one of those people. And, and not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just I decided that fast food dinner. It wasn't just yeah. going to be the Frosties. I'll do dinner too. Since I'm here at like 5.30 driving home from work. Right. So she hands me my food and I go to go. And she goes, oh, no, your drink. And I'm like, what? What drink? And she goes, your cold brew with the pumpkin spice frosty. So I'm like, all right, so do you not have it? Or is that guy just fucking lying to me? But no, so she gives it to me. So I had to get the cold brew. That was really good. The cold brew. Because, you know, there's also like sugar and stuff inside of the frosty. So it made it so really sweet. So why don't they sweet. just take whatever they're putting in the coffee and put it into the frosty machine? That, thank you, Sejin. That's exactly what I was thinking. So I figure maybe they just, they, the frosting machine wasn't empty. They still got strawberry left. Let's see what happens. So then Friday, Dale you know, stays later on Friday. So she's coming home later. And I go, hey, on your way home, you should stop by. They should probably have the pumpkin spice frosties by now. So she stopped at Wendy's and she ordered two of them on the app using the mobile app. Again, Showing in stock on the mobile app and other mobile apps, for better or for worse, the fact that, like, they only exist to collect data on us. I'm fully aware of that. It also makes it very easy to get food from the fast food places 
exactly the way I want it because you get to put and customize them. And that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to follow what you've asked for, but yeah. it's a lot easier than sitting at the window being like, I'll have a cheeseburger, a half mustard, double ketchup, no onions, no pickles, add half a tomato. Yeah, like, you can do like a with Taco Bell, like you could basically recreate any menu item you've ever wanted if you've got the app because you just got to take the time to just like take a crunch wrap and turn it into a seven layer. <laughs> yeah. And the nice thing about the, the Taco Bell app, they finally added the ability to eliminate ice from the drinks on the nice. app before I could do that. I could like be in the Taco Bell laboratory recreating something I haven't had since 1992. And then I'm like, okay, but when I get up there, despite the fact that I just ordered like an insane wrapped tostada with double beef, half chicken, like I have to say, no ice in that drink, please. All right. So now they, they have thing that they have become king of the fast food apps. As far as I'm concerned, uh, Taco Bell. Uh, I also like Burger King, but they're the only one of the other ones that doesn't allow you to eliminate ice. And that seems so strange to me. People don't want ice in the drinks. They come out cold. <laughs> right? And then it just melts. Like, if you want to keep it cold, like, I get you're going to be drinking it, like, three hours later. But it what melts. What happened with the Wendy's? <laughs> oh, okay. So Dale goes to the Wendy's and with this ordered on the app. Uh, two pumpkin spice frosties and she gets to the window and they go look we're not going to have these till next weekend <laughs> and she goes oh okay like I just ordered because it was in the app and I thought you had it yeah I don't know every other Wendy's has it this specific location we're not having it till next weekend <laughs> so what do you want instead chocolate or strawberry and she's like uh, I guess I'll do one of each and they're like, all right, okay, so half chocolate, half strawberry in both cups? And she's like, no, what? <laughs> I want one chocolate and one strawberry. You guys don't generally mix Frosty. <laughs> That's like, what a weird what a weird way to read that sentence. Like, okay, so you want us to just put it all together? What? Just throw it in a bag, maybe throw some french fries, just mix it all up for right you? Right on the top, in a bag, <laughs> uh, we'll double bag it, because it's going to eat through that first bag. I don't know, Siege, and we are living in a post-cheese and pepperoni pizza society. I don't know. You were not around for this event, but we were having a game night, and the person who was hosting it went to Little Caesars and said, I'll have a cheese and pepperoni pizza, and was handed two pizzas, a cheese pizza and a pepperoni pizza, and he lost his mind because he just meant that he wanted a, pe a pizza with cheese and pepperoni <laughs> That's such a weird way to say it, though. Pepperoni and cheese would have been the same way to, way or to say it. Maybe a, that's what threw or just off. a pepperoni pizza. I've never been to a pizza place and said, I'll have a pepperoni pizza and gotten bread sauce pepperoni. That's also true, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so he came in, like, we got there for games, and he was fuming because I had to buy both of these pizzas. And I'm like, you didn't. They were the, little... That's the other secret. You didn't have to buy them both. You could have said to them, no thanks on the I second just, one. I just wanted the pepperoni. I'm sorry. Misunderstand it. It's Little Caesars. So on the one hand, yeah, you don't have to buy it. On the other hand, each of those pizzas cost you $5. <laughs> What, yeah, but but that's even better. Not only like there's no there's no shame in saying to them, oh, I don't want that cheese pizza, because then they just turn around and put it back. They just in put the it back in the warming box. thing. Exactly. That's that's the thing, right? It's like no skin off anybody's teeth. It's not like they've made that pizza specially for you. That's been sitting there waiting yeah, for somebody to claim it. Yeah, you walked into this and they're ready to hand you two pizzas. <laughs> they're okay if you don't take one of those pizzas. But yeah, so it's just. Our language is insanity. But yeah, so then Dale came home with a chocolate and a strawberry frosty and the story of, yeah, they're not going to have it till next week. But then at the same time, I could go get a cold brew with the pumpkin spice cream right now. So I don't know yeah. what the fuck is happening. <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh, man. Yeah. So that's. That's been part of the journey of this week is trying to try all these like new exclusive food stuff that the fast food places have on display and like weirdly hitting the walls again with like, this is what I ordered. This is what I got. And I haven't done Taco Bell before the say report in about a month because the last time I did Taco Bell for breakfast before the say report, they only gave us Dale's food. 
<laughs> man, you got to stop going to that Taco Bell, man. The problem is it's the closest Taco Bell. I don't know. Taco Bell's going through some issues. You see those lists about, like, millennials are killing fast food establishments. And then, like, they always talk about how, like, Burger King's going to be dead soon. That that would break my heart. I have to just be honest with you. How many times have we spent just in the Burger King season having a good time? <laughs> it's inviting. Well, yeah, we used to swing by for the – because they always used to have the cheapest food. Oh, yeah. They used to have I don't the know cheap- if that's true much anymore. Whopper but, uh, Wednesday but, yeah, is the- now a national thing. It yeah. used to just be that thing that that one wop, that one Burger King by our college w- had every Wednesday. It's now right. a national thing, mm. which is crazy to me. Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about fast food. Um, but like, I I don't know. It's just crazy because I can't imagine that like Taco Bell of all of them should be the one kind of in the best spot. I would think. They have the locations. They they always have a rotating menu. Like whenever I go there, the line is around the building unless I go early in the morning. So I I don't I can't imagine that that one's at it. But at the same time, with Taco Bell, they did have to like change their hours up because opening up at seven and serving exclusively breakfast that was killing them. Those two extra yeah. hours. Well, when, when it was specifically the breakfast menu. Like when they when they decided to break into the breakfast game a few years ago, I don't know anybody that was like excited about that. But at the but but to your point, I think like the, about the whole like the location and all that stuff. They're also, I mean, they're also the meme restaurant, right? Like there's so many like internet bullshitty like jokes about like Taco Bell and I mean, look at the roll chicken taco. Like like the way that they are in on internet culture and Twitch culture, they'll be fine, you know? Like they they've got they've got their hands in like streamers pockets and all over the place and they they're, they're going to do great. Burger King I don't know the last time I saw a a Burger King commercial that was not immediately shit all over. You know, like like I can think of a thousand different times I've seen like the Burger King creepy king meme, but not because people are excited about Burger King, but because they because that legitimately is just a thing that they find stupid and fun to laugh at. Unlike Taco Bell, where generally everybody is like, yeah, Taco Bell's putting this more is is willing to feed you more bullshit. Let's go get it. Let's go buy it. It's like. Wait. <laughs> Strawberry twists instead of cinnamon twists? Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> like Yeah, I, I I don't know. I I'm not a fast food is such a, a weird animal for me nowadays because like I used to I mean like we used to consume like fast food on the reg like three meals a day like like when we especially when we were in college and stuff right like like fast food was kind of the way that we lived for a long time uh, much to our detriment. I am definitely paying for it in my older years like that kind of thing. But um, there was then there was a period where we didn't have any money, so I wasn't going to fast food very often. Yeah. And then uh, now that I'm back in a place where like we can get fast food if we want to, we just don't pick it very often. Yeah, I mean, it's not it... that we don't go. We'll still go through a McDonald's like if we're about to take a big trip or something and we need to get something in our system before we get on the road. Like we're not ashamed to stop at a, at a Wendy's or a you know, but we just don't we don't go out of our way for it anymore. For me, it was during the pandemic, it was like a way to kind of retain normalcy was like this thing from our past. So like I got way heavy into fast food in the pandemic. It like felt like I was doing something instead of just like going to work because I was the only person in the house who was leaving the house for work for like six months period. So it's like it, it, it helped me feel like normal again. But now that things are so, sort of returning to that state of normalcy before, I have definitely curbed my intake of fast food. And I'm happy about it. But then, like, this stuff comes along and it's like, oh, I'll get, like, rolled chicken tacos so I can talk about it on the show. And it's fun to, like, make that joke. Because it is, I mean, legitimately, one of our tasks was to go back and listen to one of our other rolled chicken taco heavy episodes. Mm-hmm. Um and I can't believe we didn't do one in 2019, but then looking at it, I believe it came back um, when you were like heading to a wedding or something. I think it got preempted by a time capsule episode uh. is what is what happened looking looking back at our thing. So there would have been one. I mean, there's still a sign in the studio for the Royal Chicken Tacos that I stole from the Providence Place Mall like the second time they had them available. And the one thing right. I will say... Now that we're talking about the world chicken tacos, then we'll move on to other topics because there's a lot of other things to talk about this week. <laughs> um, 
sauce wise, this is the year for the sauces. Okay. There are like eight sauces available that you can get to dip your rolled chicken tacos in. No. Oh. God. Sour cream, spicy ranch, guacamole, nacho cheese, red sauce, like the enchilada red sauce, creamy nice. jalapeno, creamy chipotle. Like, it's it's insane, the options of sauces now. <laughs> uh, the green one. <laughs> you have a one... recommendation for the folks? I mean, like, you... Was that? Do you have a recommendation for everybody? I mean, the spicy ranch is still the best. It doesn't get better yeah. than that. Um, I do like the creamy chipotle. Uh, it is the thing that is inside of the quesadillas, so it is okay. a that's a very strong smoky flavor there. So I mean that's it. But the spicy ranch is what always sells them. I know you're a nacho cheese man yourself, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean the red sauce. The fact that red sauce is back at Taco Bell is kind of crazy. It's been there for a while since they did the enchilado again, and they've just kind of had it on the menu since. Taco Bell is is evolving into its final form. <laughs> right. <laughs> in a lot of crazy ways. Um, but then also, just to address that task, did you go back and listen to those episodes, see, Jim? Uh, not them, them both, okay. um, but I did check out episode 44, I think is what it is, right? Yep, That's episode what I got 44. Down here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, way, way back in the day. Um, man. Um, it's kind <laughs> of gross. Looking back at episode 44, the rolled chicken taco report, how things have not changed at all <laughs> since we recorded that episode yeah. seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, it, where we were talking about the Hollywood studios and, like, they need to figure out what they actually want. They still don't know. We were talking about the movie that became a, a huge meme to the fact that we recorded a four hour episode talking about a version of it eventually. Um, in a lot of ways, the roll chicken taco report, one of the nice things about it, it honestly feels like it is what galvanized the say report into the show that it is now and will probably be going forward into perpetuity. <laughs> yeah. It is. Um, it's just a weird episode. <laughs> Because of how, like, relevant well, it is still. Yeah, and and it was really interesting to listen at a time when Thor was like reinventing itself, and um, and Justice League and DC was trying to figure out what their shit was, and then like add to that also, um, we we're we're in kind of like the early waves of some like Me Too stuff and things like that, and. Yeah, and then to, like, look at that, and then, like you said, like, to, to feel like, hmm, man, well, we really haven't gotten over any of this yet, have we? We haven't figured any of this shit out. <laughs> it was kind of disheartening. Yeah, it was it was strange. And then, like, also, I, I think about, like, the, the big movie for the, the, the female member of the DC Trinity um, had come out and we're, like, sing its praises. Like, we're so excited for the future of DC. And then... Like, we were going to do an episode covering the sequel to that movie, and you're like, yeah, I stopped that movie 20 minutes in, and I might be the only person in the world who's seen that sequel multiple times all the way through. Oh, multiple times? I didn't know about that. Oh, well, I watched it on its release date with the family, and then I watched it two more times to prepare for that episode we were going to talk about it. Yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> I will never forget that film, and I can't say it right now, because I don't want to Drew Barrymore all over the floor. Yeah, man, oof, boy, there's been some stuff this week with some people doing things. What the hell, world? What the hell, Hollywood? What the hell? Like, what is going on? It's nuts. It's legitimately insane. I mean. I... <sighs> So just only because only because you brought it up is this is where we'll start I guess but oh, yeah. but like what in anybody's right mind were they thinking with the whole Drew Barrymore show coming back in the middle of all this? So what? the the big thing about it, and it's something that we've touched on briefly before, but now like yeah, let's actually bite into it and like the deep the deeper marrow of the situation is that. Even though SAG-AFTRA is on strike, it is just their movies and TV contract that is on strike. Mm. So the Drew Barrymore show uh, falls under the network code contract, 
which covers reality TV shows, talk shows, and game shows. But so, the talk shows have been such an important part of this whole thing about how like late shows just haven't been able to book people and things like that. So that was because the reason the late shows all packed up when the writers went on strike in May. Right. So that and so even though and again I don't know if te- like I don't know if daytime talk shows and late night talk shows are technically the same mm-hmm. the way that like the network code is. They just say blanket statement talk shows. And again, Bill Maher, another person who I I have I'm not upset that the world was like Oh, here's a compilation of times that he was like handed his shit by his guests on his show. Like, so like, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> especially when one yeah. of them is from Ben Affleck and then the other one is Henry Rollins. Like, it's just like one of those moments where like, this is, huh. I mean, like, we'll, we'll go back further than that, but yeah. So I don't know if like late night talk shows could have always been running, but then the bigger issue is the fact that, our monologue is written by a WGA writer who was on strike. All mm-hmm. of our jokes and banter are written by WGA writers who are on strike. Right. This is yeah, like yeah. there's like a there's a formula that requires that that kind of work that is not present on these daytime talk shows. But I didn't. Yeah. I don't. I. I. So I'm. I'm just astounded at the at the audacity. I guess is what it is. Truly. Yeah. I mean, and I, I get where you're coming from and, and her whole, I mean, like it's, it's a, it's a gray area, but because that net code is not currently on strike, the network code, the net code, that's what it's going to be called. That's how I'm going to refer to it from now on, um, is not striking. Drew Barrymore herself could also get in trouble for being in breach of contract because, hmm. Like you, she's not. She could say like, "I'm, I'm not doing it in solidarity with this other thing," but then the studio could be like, "Oh, okay, then you're never doing this again." And right. granted, she has the money to do that, and there is that like gray area of like, what about all these people who this show employs? So like, you need to think about that thing, and that's what she considered. At the same time. You still don't have writers like and you're you're so Drew Barrymore, everybody calling her a scab. She's not a scab. She's not in the WGA. So it's not like she's going back and writing her own stuff and breaking that whole thing. But she is facilitating scabs because any writers that she hire more than likely are not members of the WGA. And it would be impossible to do a talk show without writers on some level. Right. And that's and that's just the fact of it. But it is it. I mean, it's a strange situation because SAG after is only striking TV and movies. And that's why, like, the voice acting and video game stuff is such a big deal, because then that'll be another pillar from the SAG after union that is now going on strike. But Netcode would still be running so that they can create all of those other things. It's why Jeopardy came back with its second chance tournament this week. Now, right. that was a whole thing because how are you going to get away having writers to write the clues? And they're like, well, we'll use clues that we already have used before. Right. So, and I mean, it, I haven't watched it. I tried and I thought that they might address it up at the top and be like, understand that our writers are still on strike. But so we're using clues that were written before. Like, and it, like just some acknowledgement of it, but the fact that they just treated it like normal, it's like, okay, this feels a little weird, right? It's this a feels gross. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, and I understand. I mean, and like, and it's think about whoever had the idea to be like, well, we need to make sure that talk shows, reality shows, like soap operas and all that is a separate contract from nighttime television. Yeah. Like the forethought there is gross. So it's it's been just a whole week. And I mean they didn't have great optics with them kicking out those people who had the SAG after uh the WGA pins on. Like that just looks gross. And I mean, I understand why they would do that, right? You you're gonna wear a pin like that. Are you just like silently in solidarity with them? Like is there a chance that while they're recording, you're going to do something better to eliminate a problem before it happens? 
then have to. Yeah, do I mean, th- at the end of the day, it's a private, it's private property. They can, yeah. they can do that condition. Yeah, and they, they and when you I get tickets that for that, either, but like, yeah. yeah, I mean, when you get the tickets, it specifically says that we reserve the right to, you know, revoke this pass from you for any reason. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not, it's not great. It's not, it's terrible optics, but I understand why they did it. Yeah. Right? Like, I, I, that that's that's not even something I even registered. Like yeah. I, I did read about that as well, but that's that's the the bigger thing for me is is just the whole affair of of even bringing it back, and like not and not having prepared statements. Like 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 it almost feels like they didn't they were surprised that people were like pissed this was happening. It's like what? How are, how are you surprised at this with everything going on right now? You didn't think there'd be a few questions asked about you just deciding to to suddenly just come back? I mean, honestly, it seems like a surprise that they had to go back to work. Yeah. Like that's the thing. Like a we thought this was going to be resolved by now, so we never even had to think about the contingency plan. Right. Right. A real nothing noise and nonsense three situation, but in like the real world of entertainment and, you know, and, and Drew Barrymore being like, we're not going to talk about struck work. Like I can do this show without talking about struck work. We've proven that over these past Oh my god, like six weeks, right? Where we well, have and, and her like... show is in that in that same realm where she has always had writers on and, and cooks and and YouTube and personalities and things like that, like people that are not in the that the those contract like much like us, like like <laughs> what we do. Like she, it it's not like she was so established as the person that people went to to pitch their movies that without that, what is she going to do? I can think of a thousand different segments that she can do in the meantime while they're not talking about TVs and movies. Yeah, it's just, uh, like you said before, there's no way the show can be existing without there being somebody in the room that is involved in this stuff or at the very least, um, you know, very purposely not involved. Yeah, exactly. It's, I mean, if a producer is writing bits, that's that that producer, if they're not in the WGA, is essentially a scab, right? Yeah. I'm taking on no, this that's, producer. I mean, that's, like, yeah, that's they're what it is. On the, they're, exactly. <laughs> they're filling that job that is supposed to be filled by somebody who is striking for rights. That, mm-hmm. There's no other way around it. So it's been it's been kind of sad, and like I I I don't know, but again, I really honestly feels like they were. It came time to be like, oh, we need to start shooting new episodes. What do you mean they're on strike? Yeah, you're not on strike, right? You're under network code contract, so like you could be in breach yeah. of contract, and it's like yeah, and we never know what's going on behind closed doors, so we don't know what kind of conversations have been had. But I just really wish that that I had seen something from somebody saying we fought this but we can't not do that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I want to hear that somebody said at some point, like, uh, no. And then like, even if they were slapped on the wrist after that, then fine. Like that, that, that explains it. But it, it just, without that, without that hearing about that moment of somebody just saying like, are we really doing this without that acknowledgement? I, I am just astounded. Like that, that's what I mean by it. When I say that, like, it feels almost like, they just didn't think it was going to be an issue. Um, but it's interesting what you said about this idea that they probably never thought it would go this long. Yeah. Or that they would not be protected from starting work mm-hmm. the, the way that because these things are going on. Like you, you, the, the fact that like we can't have writers, it's insane if people are like, yeah, no, you're expected to fulfill your contract to Drew Barrymore. I don't care that people can't write for you the way they were writing for you before. You're supposed to be delivering episodes of your show to us. Like, it's like, and especially with all of the stockpiling that we have seen, it really wouldn't have surprised me if for those studios and corporations, like that was just what they considered in their coffers as entertainment. They could continue to deliver. Yeah. Because of the, you know, specificity of the contracts. And it's not that they're like, nobody said no. They went and, you know, kind of gross sort of representation there. Like, it was terrible when it was revealed that Kevin, like, how Kevin Spacey revealed that he was gay in response to the sexual assault allegations was disgusting. Like, that, that is always something that's on my mind, and it's something that we talked about in the Roll Chicken Taco Report. So it's even more on my mind. But, like, that weird way of, like, I broke the rules, but there's a justification for it. 
definitely not on the same level, but that whole, we are going back to work because there are other people whose jobs and who need paychecks is like, but that doesn't change the fact that like, you're still breaking the strike for what would be one of the, the things, right? Like, That's oh, it's also kind of the point of the strike. Like, yeah. Like <laughs> us striking is getting in the way of work getting done is the, yes. Yeah. This is like when people complain like about protests and that, that get like in their way, they're like, yeah, I believe in protesting, but, but not, not when in the middle of the street where cars need to be. And it's like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> like the whole point is disruption. That is, that is the point of this. It's like you are, they, what they are doing is the writers and the actors that are on strike right now are trying to say we are worth more and this is and and the way that they're showing that is by not doing their work and lo and behold other things aren't getting done like that that is their whole point to then turn around and say well no we're going to keep doing stuff without you is j just proving that we don't we don't value that 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 work right like mm -hmm. like all you're doing is proving their point that you do not value their work in any meaningful way Right. And also, like, that should be the case study. The case study of, oh, so this element says we're not working until we're properly compensated. Mm -hmm. And then you see the trickle effect of how that, like, it affects customers. It affects Teamsters. It affects all of these other people. Like, that's the economy, right? Right. Like, you need to see how, like, if we remove this part of the economy, look what fucking happens. Mm -hmm. Like they're showing that like we are valuable because look at all of these other things that are based upon our work. And the response should not be, well, then let's just do it without them. The response should be, let's get them what they fucking want. Because then, right. then again, like we've, it's been our argument this whole time. A rising tide raises all ships. Right. Right. If if they're suddenly getting paid more money, one would hope that the unions of those other people who are not able to work without them would then be like, well, we should get some more money, too. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've ever heard it in real life, but that that economic argument that you often hear is like as a textbook example of, you know, a surgeon saying, well, I don't want the guy at McDonald's getting paid as much as I do. And it's like, well, right, they wouldn't, right? Is the idea that if somebody at McDonald's working, working 40 hours a week gets enough money to live like as they should, right? Like enough money to, to still be able to get through life without a worry. Like that doesn't mean that the surgeon is now getting they're not getting behaved on the same level as a surgeon the surgeon should be getting paid even more than that right it's like this idea that that people think that just because somebody else is getting theirs that somehow means that they're gonna that they're personally going to get like like less and it's like no that, that that's not what anybody wants in this situation i it's such a i don't like i hate <laughs> i hate that that feeling that you're talking about of people just being just like all right, well, well, we'll just do it without them. And it's like, no, <laughs> like that's, that's not the solution to this. But that is, that's been the big story all week. And, and it's yeah. ridiculous. And, you know, the Bill Maher thing has been really fun, especially in light of this, the Martin short that happened the week before where yeah. the, the, I don't remember what New York paper, it might've been the New York times wrote an article about Martin short uh, an op -ed. Like, yeah, an op -ed, and op-ed to be clear. Yeah. It was not like a, it was not like somebody writing for them, but rather some guest writer that they, people, the, the op-ed thing is important. It doesn't forgive the, it, it, I do believe it was the, now I got to look it up because, um, but it, it, it was an opinion piece. It was not some some normal writer for them just being like, I'm just going to shit all over Martin Short and get us all in trouble. Right. No, it was it was an opinion piece, op ed, editorial type deal where they're like, why, why do we still have to deal with Martin Short? We don't find him funny. And then the outpouring from everybody being like, well, Martin Short's also like a pretty genuine dude who is funny. I'm sorry that this one person doesn't like him, but we all yeah. like him. It's been really interesting to see the bizarro version of that happen with Bill Maher saying, I'm going to bring back real talk with Bill Maher. And everybody being like, here's the reason why he's an idiot. 
<laughs> well, it's I mean, the, the difference seems to be that that one of the biggest things people are saying about working with Martin Short is how enjoyable the experiences are. Right. There's there's all of these stories coming out of the woodwork about like him, like taking care of somebody's kid while they were in the hospital and things like that. Right. Like like all of these like feel good pieces about Martin Short, which is great. Sounds like he's a great guy to work with. I, I personally still find him quite hilarious. I like I have no idea what this person was writing about. Um but uh anyway <laughs> yeah no yeah but but the opposite of that sorry i'm trying not to get mad at this person i can't even find their name for like i'm like i i, I maybe they removed their name from the internet <laughs> um which i would have do after all of this bullshit but um but but the thing about bill Maher, right is like he has always had people on edge right he there's been people that have been really kind of down on him for a long time so like it's just it's easy to keep piling on that yeah, uh, it was Dan Coys in on Slate published yeah. the article titled "Why We Keep Putting Up with Martin Short," in which he described him as devastatingly unfunny. Rough. Man, did that dude ever wa- watch Jiminy Glick? Like that I, shit was whole is still hilarious. <laughs> Jiminy Glick is super funny. Yeah, it's just. Oh man. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, what he does, like that was the thing, and then the Bill Marv it all. I mean. Henry Rollins being like, you know, you're, you're kind of defending pedophilia with the whole teacher who has another kid coming with her relationship with a 14 year old in Florida. Basically, the basis for one of my favorite Adam Sandler movies. You can go listen to that episode if you want. I don't know. I, I think I'm getting which that woman goes to prison in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> and the woman in real life went to prison despite being pregnant with their second child at the time. Like. <laughs> It was a weird situation all around. Uh, and Bill yeah. Maher being like, she's in jail for being in love. And Henry Rollins being like, uh, no, I mean, that kid, the psychological impact of being a father to two children at 14, I think that that's going to be that's going to be a lot for him to handle. And we have no idea. We're so out of our element with that. Yeah, well, one of the biggest things that Bill Maher always does, and, and this is like always been a, a problem of him, is he does like no research on his guests sometimes like i i don't it's the only way that i can figure out that he finds himself in these situations because he consistently underestimates people you mentioned earlier the ben affleck thing and he has gone up against head like he is he has gone up against affleck a number of times on his show and every time it feels like he's surprised by how informed affleck is about whatever issue they're talking about eloquent in being able to speak about it and passionate like like part of it is that he also seems to think that sometimes people don't really care quote unquote about things and it's like really weird to watch him try and like pull at people to try and get them to admit that it's not like that they believe something than what they're saying or that they don't really believe what they're like whatever he's trying to do and the way that people always smack him down he just seems to consistently underestimate other people and like it's it's a pretentious thing that like that he's he's known for doing um so like watching him up, going up against Rollins is exactly that right is he's saying all of this stuff just trying to get like I don't know like like sound bites and fluffy feelings out of Rollins and Rollins is like, no, I actually have a really well informed like thought on this and I'm going to stay, stick by it. Thank you. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, wild. like to going from Bill Maher saying, how could a woman rape a man to Henry Rollins being like, well, actually, <laughs> yeah, uh, and and then like you know, I. One of my biggest issues with Mar over the years, one of his specific points that he has like always stuck by that always rubs me the wrong way is he's a very weird beliefs about arts in college. Like he he thinks that um, specifically like we shouldn't fund like kids going to college for for the arts and things like that. Like like government like loans and and um, all of this shit way way back when when some of the early loan stuff was was really being brought up like back in like the Obama era. Um, and, and I know that we student loans have always been talked about, but when, when people started getting really serious about like running on the idea of like eliminating student loans and all that shit, he was very, very much out there being like, not if, yeah, maybe if you went to school to become a doctor, I'm all for that. But if you went to school just to get like a, a um, like a poetry degree or a philosophy degree, I'm sorry, you've got to pay those loans back. You, it's not our fault that you chose this, this dead end career. And all I can think, like, I, I hate that opinion in general, but on top of that, to be a person working on a television set looking into a camera probably run by a guy that is in that situation 
I mean, he like, has a double major uh, in English and history. So, like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, I went to school for these things and then realized I wanted to be a comedian. That's his whole story. Like, right. okay. But he's not like he has a poli sci degree to be doing right. political discussions. Yeah, but, you know, he yeah. uh, he was able to find his way in this world into a multi-million dollar television contract. Why can't everybody? Yeah, exactly. That's a that's a good point. Rowdy Rowdy Piper brought that one up nice. <laughs> That would look that one up if you want to just see Rowdy Roddy Piper putting him in his place when he's like wrestling is fake. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. That's just one of those things where like Marge is like, I don't have a response to that. Yeah. And and the Martin the Martin Short stuff was just so weird too. It was, because... it was a weird thing. It was an it was incendiary thing. It's because there's like nothing to talk about. So, yeah. like, that's the type of stuff they're doing to drive the clicks. And there's another proof of just how important Hollywood as an industry, if new things are not being created and there's not new information to release, what do you put out as clickbait on the Internet to drive traffic? That, yeah, that's what I, we're I, seeing. Like, like, we, that, basically, you just go out there and just upset people, apparently, because we learned nothing over the last 20 years, but yeah. whatever. But this this past week really has been starting with the Martin Short on the on the eighth, and then going through with the whole Drew Barrymore thing, and then the Bill Maher thing. Like really, just say a crazy opinion, you'll get the things, and then also you stay in the limelight, right? Like we just talked about an article that probably would have been forgotten if not for that outpouring of love that it did. Now I did not go to Slate to read that uh, to get that information. I went to another site but then it also drives that site's traffic and thus add income so uh, it's yeah, the, whole, the whole machine is still working yeah. yeah but it's just had to find a new fuel source besides this person's going to be in the third season of this show the rumor they've been seen around the set what character could this actor be playing <laughs> yeah, yeah like it's i don't know and again, another People magazine this week, which was crazy, because it was it like it's like they were on hiatus, and then they realized, well, life needs to go on. So they're covering Anderson Cooper is on the cover. Nice. And I'm like, okay, yeah, the journalist. Okay, that, as that's the people you got to talk about because you can't talk about the other people. I guess roll it out. Isn't People Anderson magazine? Cooper like retired too? Isn't that like like that's the whole he, thing? Is yeah. like what his life is like now. So <laughs> nice. I mean, based uh, only yeah. on the cover. I didn't read it. I just no, yeah, like, I got just, the mail I can't and believe saw this it. Is the point that we're at, like people, I, 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 this idea that that the writers and the actors that are on strike right now, like, like I said, like trying to really make the make it a point. Like this is this is our work. This is what we do for you. This is the value that we bring to your day to day lives. And watching people try and just work around it is is starting to feel really gross because I really wish they would just solve it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, the WGA thing based upon that final offer that they were given by, like, I don't know how there's going to be an outcome. Like they were getting almost everything except for the numbers in the writer's room. And the response was, this is our final offer from the studio. And they're like, no, we, we did. it's good, but it's not everything that we want. So we're going to continue to strike. Like, I don't know the outcome from that that moment. It's it's not scary, but it's, you know, it's disheartening to see that, like, that offer happened. And now this is where we are a month later. Well, That's yeah, and, like... and it does. It, I mean, it does get kind of scary when you start to look at the ways in which now, you know, the auto union is on strike and, and teachers are getting really close to and, and all this other stuff that's going on that that is outside of i mean who we were talking about this just last week like the um uh the U the ups guys that went on strike right and then they got and they were able to get their contracts sorted but like a large contingency of of that was based on like man we watched the writers and the actors strike we we should be doing this too um and and the ripple effect i think we're going to be feeling that for a long time after this one yeah, I agree. And it's just now it's starting to settle as we walk into the fifth month of the, 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 the writer's strike and the third month of the actor's strike. 
Mm-hmm. It's just it's um it's a crazy time to be alive, right? And it's it's interesting and at least like at this point people aren't dying because of it, right? Like it's it's yeah. a lot more interesting to observe this one than the other. And then one final thing before we transition, because Siege and I, I did a bad thing, and I will have to mm-hmm. admit that on the show. Um, John Oliver, we've joked a long time about the one-sided rivalry that we have with him. The way that he's doing it, going on a comedy tour so that he can raise money to pay his people who are out of work because of the strike. I mean, that mm-hmm. seems like a real class act thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like No, I, I, I the, the... The behind the scenes stuff of of the Daily Show, John Oliver, um, Colbert Report, like that whole, they have always struck me as the kind of guys that do value those people that are that are doing the work. They have always been the first to admit that there is a team of people. I mean, look at what happened during COVID and stuff with with all, uh, John Oliver and stuff too, right? Like one of the very first uh, shows to shut down and things like that. Like there's just they they've always seemed very respectful of the people behind the scenes, and and this is, I mean. It's an it's an awesome thing for him to be doing, and also I gotta say, not too surprising. Like I said, like yeah, he's, no, it, he's just always... based on everything that he's done with the show and the money that he gets from that show to like help real people. That he would, of course, do that same thing for the people who support the show and allow the show to win all of the awards and get right. all of the like spread into the world. Would like you got to take care of those people. And he is one of those, like, it feels really strange to me. Oh, we also had the whole Jimmy Fallon thing come out, and I can't even go into the nefarious dealings of that show right now. But it does seem weird that they all started podcasts, and it's like a podcast where all of the late-night talk show hosts are together. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't I don't know how I feel about that. I haven't listened. But it just seems, like, strange. Like, I guess it's a way to skirt it, but... What is the grand outcome they're hoping for with it? Yeah, that streaks that that, that hits me a little bit more like um like they're just bored and looking for something to do, right? Like it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like they're hoping that that podcast is going to be something that they can like lean on in any meaningful way. It it literally just feels like without our writers and without people to to interview, we really don't know, we don't got much going on, so they're just this is what they're doing in the meantime, right? Is like, it, it feels like it's just like killer. Like it's just, they're killer just killing filler. time until they yeah. get back to work. I don't know. It's uh, it's just been a, it's been a weird time. And now I made a mistake, Seijin. <laughs> and it's nice. Cause I get to milk it for content on the show. <laughs> um, as much as I will also say that I totally use that as justification for my actions and making this mistake. Um, before I go further, I would like to thank all of the listeners who reached out to me personally to tell me that I should not go out and buy Mortal Kombat 1 <laughs> at a premium price just uh-huh. to play it five days early. Um, but there's a thing that Seijin and I were talking about last week with Mortal Kombat 1 and the fact that, yeah, it's a premium edition that comes out five days early, but that has to only be in digital format. There's no way you put the game on the shelf five days early because you're only asking for, like, piracy at that point. Right. Yeah. So when it was the Thursday that it was five days before the official release date and I looked and I found a copy of it on the shelf, I'm like, on some level, I feel like I need to purchase this. Yeah. First, first of all, the price was different. I was a little off on the price. Uh, it was only one hundred nine ninety nine, so it was only an additional forty dollars, not an additional fifty dollars. That's not a huge justification. It's just a clarification. It is me saying that I had my facts incorrect. But it also breaks it down from ten dollars a day to get it five days early to eight dollars a day. Again, not justification, just clarification of the facts because I presented some of them incorrectly. But seeing it on the shelf was incredible to me. Like, what a strange thing that you buy the premium edition because it's the one that's on the shelf, but in five days we'll also put out the basic edition. Like, what is stopping any store from putting out both of them at the same time? And then being like, what a confusing thing you did. Like, Right. 
like infamously like video games and books right constantly have that issue of this has a street date of this day and some kid working at cvs who's not it's not his job to pay attention to that shit ends up accidentally putting like harry potter out like three days early and then like then everybody loses their fucking mind right i just i can't believe that they're that they did this because of piracy because of leaks because of all of this stuff i mean like it shows that they didn't really care about the story right because like people could have been streaming it on twitch and i could have seen the entire game and then then wouldn't had to go and buy it. It, it like the i mean essentially they just took the release date and they just moved it up five days and then they said if you want to wait five more days then then we'll put a cheaper version out but the actual release date is this don't lie to me and tell me that the release date is friday and then put a version out on monday like no your release date was monday <laughs> Yeah, when I can go buy a physical copy of the game, that's its release date. Right. And that, and honestly, all the premium content that I got are just codes in the box, including... Well, digital shit anyway. Yeah, including the pre-order of Shang Tsung. Like, I did not pre-order the game. I went to the store on Thursday and found a copy of it, bought it, and, and took it home. So I didn't need to pre-order it to get Shang soon. It seems like it's one of those pre-order bonuses in the terms of, like, if you buy it early enough, we packed it in the first run of this game. Right. There's a chance that if this game doesn't sell well physically, a year from now, you could go buy a sealed copy and still get access to this character. Which is also true, because all of the codes are live for 10 years. The expiration date printed on each of those th- slips is September 15th, 2033. Wild. Like, I thought when I saw the September 15th on it, I'm like, oh, wow, that's how they did it. Like, yes, I got the Shang Tsung thing, and I get it today, but it's going to expire after, like, two when days from release. Yeah, yeah, there's a, yeah. yeah. I'm just like, that's insane. And then I'm like, no, it's 2033. So even then, like, I have not redeemed that character at this point. I didn't redeem any of it. And all I've done is play through the story because what enticed me the most about Mortal Kombat 1 was the story of it. Especially Mm -hmm. how it follows up Mortal Kombat 11 with the whole fight for the hourglass and everything like that. Spoilers for Mortal Kombat 11. But I wanted to see that because... The marketing, the fact that Raiden's just a guy and now Liu Kang is the fire god, like, that's yeah. freaking cool to me. Right. But, um, I don't know. Are you okay if I spoil some stuff about it? We'll give the no, spoiler goodness. tag of it. It was cool in the beginning, and then when Kenshi, I don't know if you're familiar with Kenshi the Blind Swordsman, was blinded again, I'm just like, Oh, so, like, we are just racing to making this world the same as it was before. <laughs> like, it's yeah. it was so cool to be like, oh, Kenshi isn't blind in this story. What an interesting thing. And then, like, oh, no, we're still going to blind Kenshi. No, you don't. You didn't need to do that. It and it's and it's literally in terms of events that had to happen again for like things to go the way in the story. That was the one where I'm like, that's the only time it really happened. Mm-hmm. Um, it really brought forward to me a lot of the problems with like fascists and dictators in terms of how Liu Kang ran the universe because <laughs> like he creates it. So first of all. He makes Johnny Cage and Sonya Blade. That's never going to happen, right? I don't know if Sonya just doesn't exist in the universe, but Johnny Cage is married to another woman who leaves him. That's the kickoff to Johnny Cage's story is that his wife leaves him because he's trying to live the movie star lifestyle, but he can no longer afford it. And he's like, you got to fake it till you make it, babe. (laughs) I'm going to be in this movie that's a version of another famous archaeologist film, but it's me instead of, you know, Mr. Mr. HF. And it, it was so weird, just some weird stuff, the way that things happen. And then what you have to think of is it's supposed to be set in, like, 2023 in this universe, 
right? Right. And for yeah. the first time, they're making a version of that very famous archaeologist film, right? <laughs> this is, this is, okay. Which, is, which yeah. is crazy. But then all Johnny Cage talks in the whole movie is fucking movie quotes and references because I guess they really wanted the player to be like, it me. <laughs> Yeah, it, not yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> it, it, sorry. Um, and it's like, so all those other movies got made, right? But that movie didn't. That one particular that franchise. That one particular didn't get made. franchise never happened until now. Well, you see, Devin, in this universe, the Beatles don't exist. So. Oh, right. Okay. So there's no <laughs> Oasis and no Coke <laughs> <laughs> and Harry Potter. What? Oh man! Yes. Well, I, I mean, so, so so it sounds like you didn't have a great time with Mortal Kombat one. Yeah, no, I'm not. I, so I was like, what am I going to do now? I have a physical copy. Maybe I can sell it to somebody who wants it early, but they don't want to pay the premium. And then Dale's like, no, nah, I want to play it. So Dale's now playing through it. So at least two people are going to get to experience the story. Um, it was good until it just turned into what every story is nowadays, which is multiverse. Again, yeah. apologies for the spoilers. But the big thing is, like, it was really interesting seeing the changes, seeing how, you know, the world was built and everything that was going. Um, I really had a problem with the Liu Kang of it all being like, I put Shang Tsung and Quan Chi, I gave them lives of, like, simple laborers so that they would never ascend to power and be able to be evil. And, like, on some levels, like, Oh, so you kind of punished them in your universe for the actions that they made in another universe. <laughs> like, you could have given them fulfilled lives. You didn't need right. to give them lives of, like, Quan Chi was a, a slave in the mines, and Shang Tsung was, a, like, a traveling kind of snake oil salesman. <laughs> so, like, they're not fulfilled in any way. In those existences you gave them, the, the desire for more is only going to grow and foster within them. So Yeah, like, it's a you... it's a it's a weird flaw to give Lu Lu Kang at this point, who is supposed to be the best of the best in the in yeah. world, right? Like, I'm just like, like, like... So like the whole time there are like these really cool moments, like Baraka shows up and he's a good guy. Baraka's a good guy in this story. And, like, he has always just sort of been a mindless slave of Shao Kahn. So the right. fact that he, like, he could still talk because he's resisting the Tarkat disease that is slowly turning him into a mindless monster and making the bone protrusions grown for his, grow from his body. But, like, I was a merchant before, so, like, he's able to, like, make deals and, and, and have these, like, elegant conversations with people. And it's like... This is cool. Barack is a good guy. And then you find Reptile and he's working for Shang Tsung. But then he's like, I'm only here because he has my family held hostage. And if I refuse to work for him and teach him my my ability to shapeshift, then he will kill my family. So like, oh, my God, they made Reptile freaking like sympathetic as opposed to just a mindless killing machine. And right, then right. like one step further than that is the fact that like he eventually turns against Shang Tsung and joins the champions of the realm. So like <laughs> wicked cool, like new characterizations for all of these people. And then lo and behold at the end, it's like, yeah, all oh, that's great. But like the one guy who like has to be the pillar of justice is like bragging about, Oh yeah, I made it so that those two guys eat shit. <laughs> like, isn't that great? And it's like, no, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're not <laughs> benevolent for that. I will not yeah, praise not you for that. Yeah. It, that's it... A, it's really interesting. <laughs> I like I I do have to say that that as far as the multiverse thing and it becoming a multiverse like it's always been a weird kind of multiverse concept anyway, right? Because of the idea of the realms and and <laughs> so, yeah, well, coming the... together to fight. But the way that they've always kind of like talked around that has always been really interesting. You know, like I, I think of like, you know, essentially to travel to Mortal Kombat, everybody just gets on like a boat and then it goes through mist and suddenly you're there. We don't know where <laughs> like Mortal Kombat ever takes place, right? Um like we have names for it we have names for the realms and things like that but the but the ways people kind of get back and forth between them has never really been like a a huge part of the concept but um 
but but you know, I, to say that it then just becomes another multiverse story is a little bit of a weird criticism so, because, like, it always has been. Okay, right, but, you know? like, different types of multiverses. This is an interesting thing. I'm going to use Yidrasil because I understand Norse mythology, like, really well. So, in Yidrasil, there are the eight worlds that comprise right. that tree, but they're all consistently one universe. Right. So while you right. have Earth Realm and Outworld and the Nether Realm and Order Realm and and all of those existing, they still all exist on the same tree in the same universe. And right. they've never actually talked about specifically multi universes until this game, because it's always been our timeline is fixed. And then Mortal Kombat 9, it's one of those situations where. Raiden tries to use the the amulet, Shinnok's amulet, to go back and adjust the timeline, saying that there will still only be the one timeline. Like they're right. very like, clear. There's a, and, there's, a, there's a Johnny Cage on Earth. There's not a Johnny Cage in other realms. He is right. the Johnny Cage of this universe, yeah. right? So that whole thing. So where it comes down to is at the end of Mortal Kombat 11, you fight against Shang Tsung for the hourglass and then like kind of big kudos to nether realm and the story of mortal Kombat one you know how like when you play a fighting game there's there's the one canon ending and the canon ending for mortal Kombat is generally Liu kang is the champion they made it so that all of those other times where you fight through and get to fight for the hourglass also happened so in addition to Liu Kang becoming the keeper of time by getting the hourglass, they have the timeline where Liu Kang loses. So Shang Tsung becomes the keeper of the hourglass. They have the universe where it was Katana who went against Shang Tsung and won, thus becoming the keeper of the hourglass, the keeper of time. So what it comes down to when it's revealed that the ultimate mastermind behind bringing Shang Tsung and Quan Chi to power, their mysterious benefactor was a Titan level Shang Tsung who became the keeper of time after he defeated Liu Kang. So like once they introduced that there are two outcomes, right? Liu Kang wins, Shang Tsung wins. You can deduce that there'd be an outcome for all of it. So what the game turns into is we need to traverse the multiverse to find the other Titan forms of ourselves to band against Shang Tsung. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, yeah. what the fuck? <laughs> wow. Awesome. And then cool. it, it's like, like that's it. And then the final chapter is cool because the story in the campaign for the Mortal Kombat games has been a lot of chapter one. You play as Kung Lao chapter two, Johnny Cage chapter three and, and so on and so forth. They tell you who you're playing as. Okay. The 15th chapter, you get to choose from any of the combatants that that have you've seen in the game. And awesome. they get to fight as like I guess the Titan version of themselves who has allied with Fire Lord uh Liu Kang to yeah. defeat the ultimate Titan versions of Quan Chi and Sang Tsung. And also who's who's agreed to the fight is a Titan good version of Shang Tsung and a Titan good version of Quan, Quan Chi, which then makes the 15th chapter huge fucking spoilers for Mortal Kombat 1 at this point. If like I just I have a question though really yeah, quick about like it. the roster. Like like narratively it sounds like these versions are like the ultimate versions of these. Why would you ever not be like, like, can I choose Liu Kang or Liu Kang's Titan version, or like, is the it Liu just Kang like a Kang that you choose swap? is like, the Titan version, like, no matter what. That's yeah. the only version that's in the game. Okay, okay. But okay. you cannot choose the Titan version of Katana. You're still technically playing as the Katana from Liu Kang as the Keeper of Time universe. Excuse me. Okay. I got Weird. taking a lot of air for that one. Um, cause yeah, cause that that final chapter. And here's the thing, get huge spoilers if you don't want this game ruined for you in any way, shape, or form. Here's the big one. That final chapter is kind of an endurance match where you're climbing up to the top of the temple and the people that you're fighting are amalgamation fighters of all the characters in the game. For example, I will let list two of them 
because I fought them back to back. And I was so happy when I fought the first one and then legitimately kind of devastated when the next fight was what the next fight was. So the third person that I fought was Stung Lao. So it was an amalgamation of Kung Lao and Scorpion. So he had on the hat. He could throw the hat. He could get over here. He had all of their moves. And Stung Lao, that's kind of funny. Right? That's kind of a funny (laughs) amalgamation name of the character. I defeat them. A little cutscene plays. I run up the stairs to the next fight. It is Scorp Lao. It is literally the same thing that I just fought with a less funny name and the same outfit, but in all black. And I've gone through the final chapter. There was a trophy for going through it twice. So uh-huh. you, you don't fight the same people every time. Like, so just RNG just kind of got you there? RNG just kind of creates these amalgamation fighters. Like Quantum Chi, which was Garrus, the Keeper of Time servant, and Quan Chi together. And I'm like, your luck that the first time you went through there, you got the same fighter, just like derpier the second time. The second time, like, like in a row, I'm just like, what the, like if it had like was spaced out a little bit. And then like the only time I got a game over was fighting against Johnny Savage, which was Johnny Cage and Baraka as one character. Because like the speed of Johnny Cage with just the viciousness of Baraka. I'm like, I don't know what to do in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was like, cool. And then like, I think the last fight is scripted to always be the same before you get to Shang Tsung and Quan Chi. And it's like a female reptile. And the name is just reptile. And honestly, I don't know what it's supposed to be like amalgamated with. Or if it's just supposed to be like a like teenaged reptile female version, because they're they're Weird. very happy to show off like three Johnny Cages come to your aid in a fight against a Shung, Shao Kahn Goro amalgamation character. So it's Goro okay. with the mask and he's swinging around four freaking hammers. And then uh, Johnny Cage from Mortal Kombat 9, Ninja Mime from the from like the fake Johnny Cage cinematic universe, and then a female Johnny Cage, who is specifically not Cassie Cage, Johnny Cage's daughter, but like a die staff counterpart to Johnny Cage. They fight Goro, and then they all get pulled into a pit, and th- and then that's the end of those characters. Like there's no rhyme or reason to what is happening in that final chapter. And on the one hand, it's kind of cool that like we had a really tightly scripted kind of cool adventure for the first 14 levels. And then the 50th one, like we're just going to do whatever the fuck we want. And like mm-hmm. on the one hand, that's kind of fun. But on the other hand, it makes everything else that I've went through feel like it kind of doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, one of the best things about the the nine, ten, and um, sorry, the uh, Mortal nine, Kombat. Nine, ten, eleven. Yeah. Yeah, nine, ten, and eleven. Yeah. yeah. The one of the best things about those the the stories with those was the ways in which the the story lent itself to the gameplay, lent itself to the story. It wasn't just oh my god, they're telling a good story in Mortal Kombat, but as like a fighting game, the way that they've they've woven that story in and the characters into that story, like the way that it just kind of all feeds itself was unprecedented. It's the reason that it got all of the praise that it that it rightly deserved, right? Like it, 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 it people hold it still in very high regard. And like to see that that just didn't work this time is so disappointing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that stems from, I will always give credit to Mortal Kombat versus DC. That was when they're like, we're going to do this large sweeping story that's going to mm-hmm. support and like encourage you to play as other characters. And like that one was real. That, that, I will still sing the praises of that game. And then that really led into the 9, 10, 11. And with Mortal Kombat 1, like, yeah, like they're trying to do some stuff. And if you are familiar with these characters, some of the changes it, are very cool. Like yeah. the fact that, but then you also at the end of the day, like it, it's hard not to feel like, oh, but this is just kind of Liu Kang's version and, and his sort of fan fiction of Mortal Kombat. <laughs> like, 
Kung Lao and Raiden will be best friends because I cannot be Kung Lao's best friend. And Raiden <laughs> can't be the god of thunder. So you guys are just best friends. And it's like, oh, that's that's cool, right? I guess I don't I don't know how to feel about this. Um, it is really cool that Lian Q is Scorpion. It is the younger brother of Sub Zero is Scorpion in this universe. And then the ending for Smoke, if you go through the towers, Tomas. Smoke's real name is Tomas. I'm a big fan of that when they revealed that it made me very happy. <laughs> and he's the one I beat the game as the first time because you never get to play as him in the story. So I'm like, well, now I'm playing as Smoke in the story. Uh, mm -hmm. His ending, he finds an orphaned uh, boy and they take him in to join the Shi and Ryu because the Lin Kuei is ultimately corrupted during the storyline, blah, 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 blah. Uh, oh, it was also cool as smoke. I had to fight cyborg smoke. And I don't know if that's something that just happened to happen through RNG, or if it's something that happens every time you play as smoke, because I didn't have a like double match or a doppelganger match when I went through the level the second time. So I'd, I wasn't sure how to, like, read that. But it felt really cool to beat up on the the purple armor, like, cyborg smoke as a human smoke in this universe. Like, that was that was a satisfying moment for me. Um, awesome. But, yeah, like, it's it just kind of feels like this weird fanfic. And then the last thing that I'll, I'll talk about with it is Shang Tsung is a pre-order bonus. You only can fight with him in, like, versus mode if you pre-ordered the game. Though, you know, I, I'm living proof and I can tell you that the code to play as him is just in the box. So I don't know if, like, the pre-order is just to make sure you get one of the early released copies where we put the code in there. Right. Not necessarily you had to give us money early because I, I went and bought it off the shelf and I can play as Shang Tsung right now. Um, but so that's his character and it kind of goes back to my complaint in soul caliber six, where it sucks that like this character, I needed to have pre-ordered or purchase her right now to play as her. I can't think of her name. She's the one who has the like hoop weapon. I, I can't think uh, of her cami or something. Uh, um, I, I, no, I, I don't, um, but there you, was a pre-order character, yeah, yeah. pre character, right? And, but then when you go through the story mode, like, you fight against it. So, like, this character was complete and obviously could be playable. They've just kind of held it behind um, this pre-order bonus. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now I remember us talking about this. Right. Tierra, I mean, essentially, it's, it's, the on -disc, uh, it's the on-disc DLC right. uh, conundrum, right? Like, this idea that, like, all you're doing is providing me the ability to unlock the, the to play this. You've already sold me the product, but if I want to play it, I need to give you more money if it's i want like, to use everything that i technically paid for because it's already on the physical disc that i bought or already in the downloaded files i need to pay you essentially for a key to, to open. yeah and it. you know i i think we probably said this at the time when we talked about it but i'll say it again here like because the truth of the matter is, is you're not paying for the physical thing anymore right all you're ever paying for now is the license to play it and a license that they can revoke at any time by the way <laughs> Like even when you buy a physical thing nowadays, like the, the, the odds are is that it still has to reach out on the internet in some way in order for you to have permission to play it. So like people have issues where they're like, I don't have internet in my house that cause I live out on a farm in the middle of nowhere. I can't play modern games because I don't have that ability to be going at reaching out on the internet every couple of minutes to verify that I own the license for this product. I um, mean, detour, but, we'll yeah. get right back to Mortal Kombat one. That's so weird with, like, everybody is pushing the Avengers game right now. It's available for, like, $3 across every platform, and it delists on September 30th. So yeah. you can buy the game. I, there's a there's it, a lot like, of there's a lot of money to be made in in the death of an MMORPG. <laughs> yeah, we we have found out in the past though. Well, then the weird thing is that they're like, but buy it because you could still play multiplayer until we shut the servers down. But mm -hmm. it's like, but then when when is that going to happen? Right. Like, give us a date on that and I'll consider it. Like, at three dot, I don't know. Like, it's that's just been a whole thing. But so back to Mortal Kombat 1 and the tier of it all, at least there was never a moment in Soul Calibur 6 where you got to play as Tira. In the right. weird story adventure mode, you went up against the character of Tira and other characters who used her fighting style. In Mortal Kombat 1, 
again, spoilers. I, I, I don't know. I, like at that point, it means nothing, right? At this deep into the conversation, we've said it every time, but still, the thirteenth chapter of the story is Shang Soon. So I get to play as Shang Soon, no matter so, what. So to clarify, is this like a Catwoman Arkham City situation where if you don't buy the DLC, that <laughs> chapter just doesn't exist? Or I did not and install like, Shang Soon. Like a... So hmm. I got to play as Shang Soon, no matter what, because there is a chapter in it where you play as that character. You get to play as Shang Soon. You just don't get to play as him. In like versus mode or online. So you haven't. So you haven't put the license. You haven't put the the code in to unlock him, and you were still able to. And play I was him. able to Is play as him for an entire chapter. Yeah. Wow. And that just felt like what a really kind of gross, skeezy sort of way to do it. Yeah, because then it's like, oh, but you can't actually use this character outside of that story mode unless you pay his money, and it's like. Right, and I already paid you. And it's like now you get to see how fun he is. Yeah. You get to learn about how to use him as a character. Don't you want to fight against him with his, with friends? Don't you want to see his fatalities? And as much as it's a pre-order exclusive, they've already gone on record as saying he will be available for seven ninety nine as mm-hmm. a character. So it all means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> But oh, yeah, but man. ultimately, so it means I shouldn't pick this one up for my spooky plays. Is what you're no, saying? No, this that is Mortal not Kombat a spooky play. Probably, yeah. uh, honestly, it's a six-hour story. Now, granted, I'm me. I'm fair familiar with 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 fighting games, but I beat the story in six hours. That feels like the fastest I've completed a Mortal Kombat story. I have to be honest with you. It it I started at one. I started at, yeah, 1 o'clock and I was done at 7. Well, one thirty and was done at 7.30. So, that's six hours in my book. It says on my PlayStation for stats, 100% game progress in six hours. <laughs> so, and I don't really feel any sort of, like, pull or drive to keep playing the game at this point. Yeah, so, I mean, like, we talked about that too with the with the past ones that you specifically you felt like the stories were were the the reason to go to them, and that you weren't really doing the multiplayer with those too, though, right? Like, yeah. So but I now don't know. The story if... is really not that big of the package. Then what yeah. does that do for you? Right. And they did. A, I mean, like they definitely got me interested in the story with all the talk, and and this is going to happen this way and that, and some cool stuff happened if you're familiar with Mortal Kombat lore, but I just. To then have paid the premium of, you know, 40 extra dollars to have access to it early, mm-hmm. really just like, I, I don't, I don't think this was worth it, but I got <laughs> to talk about it on the show. I, I, I've completed it. The story will not be spoiled for me. Apologies if I spoiled it for you. There's a lot of other little intricacies that occur. Um, there's some good voice acting. There's also some kind of terrible voice acting. I'll shout out Kelly Hugh for what she did in it. I'm a big fan of Kelly Hugh anyway. Um, but she plays a couple of roles and was really good. And honestly, Megan Fox playing Natara was pretty good as well. I'm a big fan of Megan Fox. So even though, like, it really kind of feels like they edited her to look like kind of an idiot in the Meet Megan Fox Mortal Kombat YouTube, like, tie-in video... Yeah. Uh, which is sad, right? Because that's what they can do with editing. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, she also has some notoriously weird moments in her life. I mean, she's the one that uh, is with um Machine with Gun the Kelly. rapper now. What's his name? Machine Gun Kelly, right? Yeah. And they they just they just get some. They've had some really weird coupley moments out in the world that kind of rival like the old like Angelina Jolie, Billy Bob Thornton years. Like. <laughs> yeah. So we give each other our vials of blood. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what are you doing? So yeah, I mean it 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 was a, a pretty solid experience. Some of it's not good. You'll see some of the stuff. I mean, my favorite glitch that I encountered is I had subtitles on. I played the game as intended. I w- made sure everything was defaults so that any sort of like review that I'm giving right here on the show or any sort of conversation, it's based upon What that makes me feel like the majority of people are going to play. Did I want to do like test your might moments during the story? No, but I had them turned on. And honestly, 
that is the best sort of impl- implementation of a quick time event in storytelling that I have seen in a long time. It didn't feel intrusive. Cool. It felt I, like a I way to immerse me. I honestly thought we moved away from quick time events. It's wild to me that they are in this game. <laughs> well, I mean, but they're not quick time events in that it's just like the test your might stuff from the original yeah. game where like they'd break the thing. It comes down to, oh, we have to get through this door. So you test your might and then you punch through the door. Or, oh, we need to stop Melina from, from killing us. We test our might and then we're able to push her off of us. So it's not like hit the hit the triangle button at this point. I agree that it felt like we moved past them, but like Mortal Kombat uniquely has it sort of woven into it. And they're smart enough to be like, if you're done with these, because we know that as a like gaming community, we kind of passed them and left them in the dust. You can mm-hmm. shut this off right from the beginning. <laughs> so, but it felt satisfying every time I got to do one. Which is saying a lot, because most quick time events are the part where you see your first game over in a game like this. Hmm. Because, oh, I couldn't do it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Who knows? Um, Yeah, so that's, I think that's there. And let's talk about spooky games. Yeah, Mortal Kombat 1 is not one. Unless you <laughs> want your wallet to be scared to death. Oh, nice. There it is. Put that on the box, you cowards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, um, yeah, man. spooky so, games so, for CG. I mean, I, so here's the thing. Uh, I'm trying to think of how I want to want to start this. If When I say, this is a good place for us to start. When uh, when I say the words mascot horror to you, what, is, what does that mean to you? Like, do you have like that? Well, I mean, mascot horror. What jumps to my mind is unfortunately something like Five Days at Freddy's or Five Nights at Freddy's. No, I, I mean that's that is a quintessential example. But okay. like, what, what, like, what are what makes mascot horror stand out as a as a different kind of genre than than other types of horror games, right? Well, like, like, I've 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 never played them. No, but that's I, okay. But in my yeah. but where I'm coming from, as somebody who's never played them, games where the villains are. Things that are generally seen as harmless, warped and twisted to be horrific. So that's um that's so within narrative and game, like totally on point. There's another element to that as well, though the uh, the more nefarious element to mascot horror, and that is the marketing that comes hand in hand with them. Um, so like I, I'm thinking of like Poppy's Playtime when when they like released a whole bunch of lore, but it was all hidden behind NFTs that you had to buy from their market. Or but like a uh, garden, a uh, garden of Ban Ban is one of the big ones uh, right now in in the uh, in in the YouTube verse as it were with this kind of horror and it caught a lot of shit because it's a merch store launched before the game did like that kind of thing. Right. Um, so you say five nights at Freddy's and one of the big things about five nights at Freddy's is the, like, it's not just the games, which are actually relatively pretty cheap, even up to, uh, I would even say that, uh, I think now you can get security breach. The latest one that was a PlayStation release. Like, I think you can get it for like 30 bucks, right? Like, like there's, there's, there's not much money being made on the games alone, but the reason that it is a multi-million dollar franchise is because of the toys, because of the movie, because of the books, because of the comics, right? Like, like there is so much going on around the, on the on the outside of those games that are making money for that franchise, and that's true of all this stuff, right? Um, well, a YouTuber that um, that I follow that that breaks a lot of this stuff down, uh, Matt Pat was actually uh, referencing the other day that that he knew Garten of Ban Ban had kind of made it with the big boys because he was at a state fair and one of the cheap knockoff toys you could win at the prize gate. There was Freddy stuff, there was Poppy Playtime stuff, and there was Ban Ban stuff. And he's like, that's how you know that these guys have really like gotten in, uh, gotten gotten their foot in the door. Is that not only can you buy merch from them, but there's now bootleg merch out there of their shit, right? Um, which I think is a pretty <laughs> a fun. Funny uh, uh, line that, that they to cross, but it's actually pretty pretty accurate. Um, you know, you've made it big if somebody can win your shit at a at a pop a balloon game, right? Once there's um, knockoff merchandise, that's like a real right. big strong bad said that, which is why he had officially unlicensed merchandise, nice. so that he could like make it look like he had made it. <laughs> fantastic um yeah so so kind of hand in hand with the mascot horror element is that right so because of because of that whole side to it i have 
a very love-hate relationship with the genre. I think there's some really, really interesting stuff going on in there. I mean, I've talked before that I'm, like, deep in the in the Five Nights at Freddy's stuff. I, I don't know how I ever found myself here, but, like, we could talk for hours about, like... <laughs> we, we could talk about, like, illusion discs and robot kids and all that shit if you want, and, like, the ways in which that, that genre has gone, like, weird in terms of timeline. Like, certain characters that are created by other characters, but then you find out that the, first, that the second character is, like... 10 years younger than them so how does that work that kind of shit it's a there's there's all sorts of weird stuff in the five nights of freddy's thing, uh verse that i've kind of found myself in right so i clearly have my love there but then like i hate the merchandising side of it and i hate the idea that like story is locked behind nfts or like we're gonna we're gonna put this like this t-shirt line out first before our game ever comes out that whole thing um i've never gotten really deep into um some of the like comic books and webtoons and stuff that some of these ones i think bendy got really big with that sort of stuff there there was a uh, because of the nature of bendy and the ink machine that you know it being kind of that that homage to the the old school um rubber hose uh styling of like old um uh animation mouse cartoons yeah. animation thank you <laughs> um but uh but yeah like be, with that already kind of baked into the story that naturally led to them doing things like comics and and web shorts and things like that and so like that feels kind of okay to me but i even that i still never touched i, I don't buy any of that stuff right and so that whole Funny side you of it should mention that it... as i sit next to a sealed bendy and the ink machine construction set that was given to me as a gift because like, oh, you like Legos. You like, you like video games. And I'm like, thank you. But I'm probably never going to open it. I have no connection to that. And it's, it's not Lego. Like if it were a Lego set, maybe I do it. Cause like it's Lego, but like one of the cheaper knockoff ones, like it's not even mega blocks. I couldn't even tell you <laughs> what it is. I'll, uh, I'll bring, I'll get it down and I'll, I'll construct I'll let cubes. You know. yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that whole, it really turns me off, and it and it makes me really wary whenever somebody wants me to like really get on board with like a with a horror game. Now, if it if it is in that genre, if it is in that realm, I I'm always really kind of like, where's the where where's the intention? Is this just to get me to go and buy you know toys, or is this or is this actually something with some depth to it? Um, so all of this is to say that I found myself uh falling in love with and am currently deep into. Uh, a mascot horror game that I never I wasn't I was not prepared to be as deep into this game as I am and that is uh, My Friendly Neighborhood um, it is fucking buck wild it is uh, uh, so there's a Sesame Street slant to it it's about a, a kid show back in the, the uh, an unspecified time like 30 years ago or something like that uh there was a big show that mysteriously kind of goes off the air and at some point it starts playing again and so your character is a is a mechanic that is sent to a building to turn it off essentially wow. and <laughs> and it goes from there right it's like you you come into this building to discover that the puppets are alive and it's very like weird and scary and there's these puzzly elements and the biggest thing about it is um is that while these other games all kind of have you know your your pretty stock standard like jump scare stuff or a lot of them are very amnesia style play where like you you kind of just have to hide from things you don't really get to like fight things but if you can you, you can make sure that you you don't get seen then you're good to go that sort of stuff this game uh friendly neighborhood is so resident evil in its dna it's it's crazy like that's it's one of the things that's really got me about it so like going around and finding pieces to put together to make a key to get through a door that kind of puzzle building right like that that um you know all i think of uh, whenever i think of resident evil puzzles now is, is the shadow puzzles right like turn this block in just the right way so that the, the the door opens up or you know that kind of thing um and there's all of that sort of stuff all over this game right plus on top of that the story gets so like we we overuse the word meta a lot and it's not really it's not really meta so much as it, it's it's purposefully vague it is talking about things that are very clearly from our world but not putting specifics to it so there's a ton of stuff about like PTSD and about the ways that media can really um 
uh, can really harm a person if if it is you know if, if the wrong thing is watched constantly. You know, they, they, there's a lot of like let's talk about you know let's talk about war porn without talking about war porn, but essentially that's what we're talking about, right? Is like you know there's even some more than direct shots at like Fox News or, or any news really, but but Fox News is the one that comes to mind for me in just the ways that it literally poisons people in this world. <laughs> like, it, like, yeah, there's there's some really, really cool stuff going on with that. And so like, I don't want to spoil too much, but like you go in and there's just these delightful character models that are these puppets that are, you know, there's like one guy that is a, a giant um, mechanic for the building. Um, he's he and he lives in the sewer pipes and he pops out and he's just this big like he he's like this big snuffleupagus looking guy and things like that like there's there there's all sorts of really cool beautiful moments to it um in terms of the visuals and the storytelling that i'm just completely sold but the way that it got introduced to me was be through youtube and through steam and stuff pitching it in this like genre this mascot horror genre and that's cool i mean that's i i get it though because I don't follow that stuff, so it's not going to be shown to me. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's just it's it it's a it's a risky move with me because like that that I cringe a little bit when people talk about it. But it is you know it, it is a successful genre out in the world that has existed for a decade now. Like like I I I'd be dumb to talk about it like it's not like a viable place where art is being made right like there are people in that realm that are doing really good work and it's just i just immediately i'm just struck with like where where are they placing their time right and so one of the things i will say about um friendly neighborhood above the rest for me is that i'm sure that there's merch available for it but it's not something that was pitched to me anytime I was playing the game, right? Like, whereas some of these other games, you open it up and right there on the, the opening screen is like, even above their like play game button is the is the go to store button, like that kind of shit. And it's like, it, it's just in your face that they obviously are marketing more than just the video game to you. It just, it, it, I think of like, I think of back in the 80s and 90s, like where we would watch like He-Man and G.I. Joe and, and Saturday morning cartoons that were always just ads for the toys, right? Like, so like, I, I can't be too offended by that. Um, but it's just nice to be able to find one that feels like a, a kind of a genuine masterpiece of a game. Like the way that the way that the story unfolds and what you're doing like really feels important not just in the world of the game but also as a human in the world like out here like i feel like man yeah like i i am kind of reaffirming some some beliefs that i have right now and that and that feels good you know all right so just jumping off of the it's been a decade this genre thing we have had taco bell breakfast for a decade i cannot believe that that's something i looked up uh, earlier and I just didn't fit into place to slot it in. Secondarily <laughs> of that, that idea that video games are the new marketing like entertainment in the same way that 80s Saturday morning cartoons were is a huge thing that went through my mind playing through Mortal Kombat 1. So like do not feel any sort of way about that. And then I think about um, we're kind of in this weird I'm going to say golden age of video game merchandising. And I mm -hmm. don't think it's necessarily a golden age, but I think that to not define it that way would be wrong. I'm not super excited about it, but other people are. Like, you right. look at the fact that Battletoads, a game that totally felt like it was originally created to capitalize on the Saturday morning cartoon anthropomorphic animal. I mean, like to the fact that they had a pilot for an animated series, but they never really had tie in merchandise. They just got a toy line released. Um, Battletoads, man. The, how does that game even exist? They get sucked into the game in the game. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 you're not wrong. Um, <laughs> so like they now have a, a toy line, right? They have these things and they're not cheap figures. They're like $60 figures. Uh, Streets of Rage, um, the Streets of Rage 4. I have a Streets of Rage 4 figure that was given to me as a gift. And then I looked at that figure up. And I'm like, that's a $60 figure. Like, I don't want to touch it at all. I'm just afraid mm -hmm. I'm going to break this thing. 
because yeah. like, and it's really high quality. And then that led me to like just this past week, not even knowing that this is what we were going to talk about, the marketing of it all, a list of like the top five video games that we want to see toys made from. Right. Yeah. Cause like Jada toys is now doing the street fighter stuff. So that's a whole discussion. So every fighting game now is we want figures from it. Storm collectibles, the ones who did that streets of rage figure, they've already done a couple mortal Kombat figures. And I have to imagine that they're just salivating looking at all of the potential figures that could be made from this new game just in time right. for Christmas. Like it's just, it's this weird thing where that has definitely been the shift, but the first thing that you have to do in order to start selling that merchandising is to legitimately make video game characters mascots again. And for the longest time, it was kind of just Mario. Like as much as you have a Sonic, as much as you have a Crash Bandicoot, the one who persisted as a video game mascot was Super Mario. And it I wasn't think only second to Mario would probably be something like Pokemon, another Nintendo property, right? Yeah, I mean, I woke up this morning to people losing their mind on X Twitter about Pikmin plushes being available at Target. Like, I'm talking grown men saying, oh my god, I can finally complete my 100 Pikmin collection. And then him showing him standing in front of 100 Pikmin plushes. And I'm just like, what the fuck is that? That's crazy. But it is it is a thing where, like, marketing and merchandising is really lending itself to games. And looking at Mario, and a big push of it is the fact that he finally made the successful, air quotes, leap to the silver screen. Like, the figures that they're making tied into that are way better than any other Mario merch that we've seen up to this point. Because, yeah, yeah, well, and I'm sure we'll see the same thing with Five Nights at Freddy's inevitably when when yeah. all of that goes into effect too, right? Is we'll see some high-end ones there too. There's already some pretty high-end ones, you know, it, it, but in the world of horror, right, and, and specifically horror video games, yes. like the, the ways in which this then allows that genre to really think thrive because like it was a you know it was kind of a known like glut for a while of of, of uh, i mean a lack I, I should say of of like good horror video games right like there was like a period in like the the 2000s 2010s where like it just wasn't the genre people were excited about or if they were they were all they, they all had to lean on the safe side and be like overly like action oriented right like look at what happened at the uh, uh, at the end of um dead franchises space. like dead space yeah. where they just became like super action heavy or um uh dead planet right isn't, isn't wasn't that one of those ones where like lost you, you, planet like, wake up is that like, the name snowy... of that one mm. i don't know i don't know i don't know dead planet but uh, yeah and then like you have like the fear games where the whole thing is like you're on like a psyops team and things like that and, and you know so they there's the only way that you could get a horror game really made is if you were doing something that also was very Gears of War, right? Like that kind of thing. You yeah. had to you had to include some really good like fight mechanics and, and all that. Then this has really allowed all different sorts of games to come out, right? Like one of the other big ones in this in this realm is uh, the Hello Neighbor series, which has like three other games now, and like every game is a different genre of game and style and, and things like that. It's it's wild. Um, but it allows them to to do like hide and seek games kind of like amnesia but like also make bank off of it and then they also can do game they can also in that same realm do like physics puzzle games and things like that right um but all of them are all under this banner of this character that they've created that they can then sell a bunch of books about and things you know yeah i i it it's strange i don't it's cool that it's a resurgence there but it also really speaks to the games that I put on my list in terms of spooky games. Mm -hmm. um, like, cause a couple of, most of the ones on here are kind of parody of what that horror story is. Yeah. Like, I mean, I put together 15 games and well, and then 16 cause one occurred to me, but I'm going to start with that one that occurred to me while we were talking about sort of like the mascot horror stuff. And that is the House of the Dead Overkill. I don't know if nice. you ever got a chance to play that one. That's like the really cool, like rotoscoped one, right? To make it look like an yeah. like, old comic book almost. So it's rotoscoped, but it really plays like a B movie. The closest, um, 
like analog that I would talk to would be like the Grindhouse films. Okay. And yeah, yeah. like, and that I think that's safe to say because I'm not actually naming. Like, if you look for Grindhouse, you can't find that. Um, <laughs> but uh, in the fact that like it's real schlocky, uh, when you get to the final boss, there's a reel missing, and then you come back and it's like, good thing we found these mini guns. And then the final <laughs> fight is using mini guns against the the big mutant. Nice. Um, like it, like like good comedic stuff. But that game in addition to being a horror game, is also sort of the satire of what a B-movie is. Sure. And then I look at, like, Evil Dead Regeneration, that's sort of satirizing what a video game is with the (laughs) backdrop of the Deadites. Like, there are straight conversations between Bruce Campbell and Ted Raimi's character where they're like, oh, so you just got to collect the three things then kick me through. It's kind of like in a video game. And it's like, oh, we get it. Like, uh, uh, wink at the camera. But, like, that's the way that they were able to do Evil Dead Regeneration. And that was, like, a 2000s horror game, right? It was, like, that nodding wink to the camera. Uh, Ill Bleed is one that I would recommend. I think everybody should play Ill Bleed. I think they should fucking remake Ill Bleed for modern consoles. Because it is a Dreamcast game that, like, I imagine most people have not heard of. Had you ever heard of Ill Bleed before this conversation? No, I had not. Follow, I had not uh, heard of Ill Bleed. Ill Bleed. Uh, Ill Bleed. Sorry, yeah. horror themed amusement park is what I'm finding. Yes, that is exactly what it is. So in this world of like horror mascots, right? Mascot horror, Ill Bleed, and the world that it creates. So the whole point of Ill Bleed, it kind of plays on the initial Resident Evil stuff, where when you open a door, you never know what's going to be on the other side. So okay. like you're going through and you're exploring and you'll open up a door and then the door will open. And the one that has stuck with me, the reason why Ill Bleed is something that I've never gotten past the first level, because I like just don't understand the game and the controls are legitimately terrible. But in that first level, one of the doors I opened was a TV and on the TV was an old TV show called Fall Down Bear. And it was just, oh, kids, it's time for Fall Down Bear. And then, da 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 And the bear on the TV just fell down flat on his face. And all the kids cheered. <laughs> and, like, that's the whole thing of Ill Bleed is that, like, it's jump scare stuff. And then, like, that one was, like, quote, unquote, a dud. And, like, because they're out there. But that is a game that, like, totally leans into... There's this established carnival that it like had to close down and all of these other things. It's kind of got the B movie elements in it. And as like one of the characters, spoilers for Ill Bleed, and this is just because I've watched playthroughs and I've read a lot about the game, despite the fact that I only ever played it at a friend's house, so I never got to like get deep into it. One of the kids has their brain stolen in the game, and like an optional mission is regaining his brain. Or just leaving him as a mindless zombie, hulking monster. <laughs> like, like, wild. Like, this, like, yeah, like, like, this is just a. I am super into this, and there is no way for me to play there's it. There's no way to play it. But, like, it is a game that, like, if I had the means, I would play it every Halloween. And it's just. I don't know. They should. That's a game that, like, legitimately. Even if it's just somebody who does it on the side on the internet, like, in fear of cease and desist at any moment. It is something that needs to be like brought into the modern era. Also, um, good good name for a main character, Erico Christie. Yeah. Er- Erico Christie. <laughs> yeah, it's it's cool stuff. So like those those are a lot of like genre sort of satiric horror things that exist. Also, like one of the ones I put in here is the Secret of Monkey Island or Maniac Mansion, because again, mm. it's like modern comedic elements for the eighties and nineties. <laughs> merged with like these horror stories yeah like yeah. so like secret among gallons almost like voodooric folklore and like fear of the unknown in nature where maniac mansion is like your standard mad scientist in a house <laughs> yeah but those well, are... it was actually so it's funny that you mentioned um uh, monkey island because one of the ones i was considering was uh was the monkey island um uh, what's the one that Rare does? The the Sea of Thieves, uh, the crossover event that they yeah. just that they just released, which is apparently a blast. Um, 
and uh and yeah i was hoping that there'd be some good like ghosty stuff in it and things like that because i mean like that is what i think of when i think of monkey island yeah i mean the the main villain is a ghost a zombie a demon uh sort of like the guy from that movie where he's just a spirit that jumps from body to body Mm -hmm. and then he's a ghost again in return so i mean it's it's good stuff like it's like there's horror elements to that um and then you know Kids being in scary situations is another mm-hmm. one that kind of lends itself to the mascot of it all. So I put guilt on here. Guilt nice. is like sort of a secret banger in terms of spooky games where I think. Well, of. And now it's uh, yeah, and and I had no idea it was going to be available not on the the Google Stadia, right? Yeah. Like I, I was. I and was it's on sale on Steam time. right now for like mm-hmm. fifteen dollars. So if you, I think not... it's on Switch and and uh, and PlayStation as well. I, I yeah. don't know about Xbox, but um. I don't know about sale, but it, I, I do know that like Steam does have it on sale right now. So nice. if you're looking for something like, and that game, I'm the the amount of times where I was like, kind of shook to my core with like, just how nasty like bullying can be, and the real horrors of this world were really cool, and the manifestation in that game excellent. Um, costume quest again. Like, it starts out fun, and then it goes really off the rails. And with the announcement of Thousand Year Door finally getting a remaster in this past Nintendo Direct, like, Costume Quest really kind of plays like it was inspired by that. So if you want to get excited. um, I've never done the sequel or the DLC. Uh, And then Little Nemo the Dream Master. I know that it's, like, not technically spooky, but like you end in like nightmare. The NES game? Yeah, the NES game. Like one of my favorite mm-hmm. NES games. Um is out there. It's it's they're doing a bunch of sequels to it. Like there are I think three sequels in the world. They're not sequels. Three additional games in the world of Little Nemo since Windsor and McCoy's stuff went public domain back in twenty nineteen. Like mm-hmm. people are making games because they have love for the 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 Dream Master. And even though, like, you end in Nightmare Land and there's some, like, kind of horrific imagery in Nightmare Land, but all of the other dreams, like the Mushroom Forest and Topsy Turvy or my house, like, if you put yourself in the shoes of a child and how those things can kind of be scary to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, now, you know who, um, speaking of just, like, games with really good scary levels from back in the day is the uh, the Page Master had some really good um, creepy. Yeah, everything uh, from the, the spooky book. I don't mm-hmm. hear the and there's pirates there too, mm-hmm. and Whoopi Goldberg, and she might be the most terrifying thing of all. Um, <laughs> you know, we didn't really talk about the view because I don't think we're watching it, but oh, there was a there was a clip from that this week that was kind of like, oh yeah, these people. Maybe it's okay that they're back on the air because they can't have writers if that's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, if that's the kind of <laughs> shit they're going to say, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So all those, uh, in terms of like legitimate horror medium. I don't know if you remember that game. It might be the medium. Uh, it's the, big... Was that the the PS5 like premiere game? Yeah, right? its big claim to fame was that it was kind of a tech demo for the Xbox Series X. Oh, Xbox. Okay. Yeah, um, and I believe it's made the leap over to PS5 now. I've not played it there. I played it on the Xbox Series X. Lot of really disturbing imagery. Really dark story. Uh, to the fact that like the reason why I stopped was the final boss of like the first or second chapter, his whole like background and explanation. And then how he rep was like represented in the, the ghost dimension was like, no, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not interested in this. Like he was a Nazi pedophile and I'm like, I'm good on this. Not that I have a problem, but like, it, it, this seems like a lot. <laughs> Yeah, this seems like, and that's like not the where kind you're of stuff I want to play from, with. Like, where are you gonna go from here? <laughs> I don't. It it just it it's it sat unsettled with me. But I can still admit, as in terms of a, like a spooky game, it is real good with like the immersion into the whole world of it and alternate history and such. So that. And then my piece to resist on, well, I mean, Splatterhouse, it's a quick little beat em up, real fun, like, you fight all the, the monsters from, 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 like, the horror movies and things like that. Yep. And, you nice. know, he's dressed like Jason. 
Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. fun. Well, I mean, he just has a hockey mask on, the terror mask. Ooh, and any of the Splatterhouse games are just a blast. But like the the top of the list, if if you're looking for a spooky game, I mean, Symphony of the Night, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. In terms of if you even if you are like from as familiar with it as I am, the way that that the castle shifts and changes, and like how the environment is freaky. And not freaky and like, oh, it's just the library, but holy fucking shit, look at all of the plants that are attacking me. Like, that's a, that's another one that I I do recommend if you're looking for a spooky game. Excellent, man. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're um, welcome. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I am I'm gonna dive into something uh I just I, I, I mean I'm in doing my friendly neighborhood right now. Um the thing about it is that I I know where it's going and I know I'm close to the end. So like, it's a, it's a short play, like not, not too short. I have put 15 hours into it already. So like, um, you know, there's definitely a good amount of game there. Um, but, uh, but like most of these kind of more independently made, um, horror games, um, you just, I'm getting to a point. I, I, I wish that I had a better online setup and crew for something like GTFO. Cause GTFO would be a blast this time of year. Um, have you ever seen anything from it? No, I can only essentially assume it get the fuck out yeah yes yeah <laughs> but um so so you're on a team of four right it's it's a four it's a four person team um and you are dropped into a facility and you need to go and collect uh usually it's like we need a, a dna sample and it's like it's like six rooms deep in this like warehouse but as you're going through the warehouse there's creatures to fight right like there's there's like alien zombie creatures they look a lot like um like the creatures from the uh last of us series um and you know there's various versions there's bosses and things like that and um and, but like there's a lot of really great elements to it in in the in the creep factor in like it's got really really low lighting like everything is pitch black um, most of the time you can only just see off of it based on what your your flashlights are on and things like that um the combat in it though is is like super intense like everybody has like a special ability like there's one guy that has a um uh, like you can it's a loadout game so you you can you can go through these pretty much uh, um at your leisure but like uh, one guy has like a turret that he can put out uh, on your team. Another guy will have like sticky grenades so that like the creatures get stuck in them so that you can take them out and stuff. So there's a lot of really fun gameplay elements to it. Um, but it is also just scary as hell because like if you run out of ammo, it, there there's a limited amount of ammo at every level. So if you run out, sorry, you're done. <laughs> like that's just there's no more ammo to be had. Um, you know the the um, the overarching story to it too is also pretty wild because your prisoners and you're being sent in to do this and like the ways in which it's very suicide squad like like if you complete this then we'll we'll take years off your sentence type shit um and then so that also leads to a lot of stuff of like they're clearly just sending you to your death <laughs> like that kind of thing wow I mean, that's uh that sounds interesting i don't know it's it's yeah, super like... fun like and and i've played it once i've been able to pull off an online match with with some people for it but my my rig my computer i i need a new computer if i want to continue to do stuff like that yeah well i've been there and i i solved my laptop problem but i still have not solved my uh desktop like situation so mm. we'll see what happens my friend <laughs> cool yeah but i'm excited i'm excited yeah. to get into some some playing and i'm excited to uh, kind of get into the spooky season cool it's, cause it's i cannot believe we still can't talk about movies because man there's like <laughs> in in terms of the spooky season stuff there I'd, I'd love to talk about some stuff there too but i know it's <laughs> i it's it's really strange and like stuff's still coming out and i don't i don't know i don't know what to do i wish that we could talk about tv with all the stuff that's like been announced that I'm excited for and formulating deep theses on, but you know, I, I, I've been hearing a lot more about stuff that is not coming back or around and yeah. how things are not getting developed right now because of everything going on. Yeah. So, I mean, we're still out there. We're still holding in solidarity. It's just, I don't know if anybody expected it to go this long, except for the studios. I'm pretty sure they're happy that like, this is a real easy way for us to save money right now. Oh man. Because there's a lot of shit going on with the idea that, like, people seem to not be going to movies right now. <laughs> and then, like, nobody's watching TV right now. So I don't know how happy they could be, but... Um, it's all about the money, man. And if they're not hemorrhaging money in other ways and they can make it look like profit, I don't know. I mean, how yeah. is Warner Brothers still 
with the year that they've had, like, well, we're still profitable. How is that possible? I mean, especially considering where they were last year. In a year that I would say they were they doing were much better than they were this it. year. Yeah. I don't know. All right. So we shared our tasks um, that we did for this week. Are you ready to give people the task for next week, Seijin? Uh, I am. And it's going to be a much more directed one towards you, Dev. But uh, but everybody else can participate in, in other ways if they want. But go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I get to start first with mine? Yeah. Okay. Well, because starting next weekend I can get my hands on a pumpkin spice Wendy's, we're going to do a little food review on the Sarah Report. Um, Seijin, you just got to try a mini pumpkin spice Frosty from the Wendy's, and then we'll talk about it. And if Wendy's introduction into the pumpkin spice war that will eventually lead to the franchise wars... Um, is good, bad, or ugly? I mean, we'll get to do well, it. We'll be like the Phantom spice Gourmet. Must flow, Devin. <laughs> the pumpkin spice melange. <laughs> <sighs> uh, yeah. Well, it's funny that, that this is okay. So this goes a little bit hand in hand with mine. Um, Devin, I've been thinking about this one for a while, and I I do really sincerely like want to see what you do with this, but it could be anything. I want you to cook me a meal, Dev. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I cook you a meal? I don't want to do that. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I want you. I, I one of the big things that that I am doing in this kind of downtime because we're not going to movies so much, we're not watching a lot of TV stuff right now, and all of this sort of stuff is I'm like getting back into like the cooking stuff, especially because it's the high holiday season and all that. Um, and so yeah, I just at some point this week, and like I said, it doesn't have to be. It could you could just make mac and cheese if you want, but I want you to make me a meal, and I want to talk about what you made and why you made that and how you made it. Well, Seijin, that's perfect, because I, I joked that I'm the Bachelor Chef, and now I'm going to have to put my money where my mouth is. <sighs> okay, yeah, C- cooking Seijin a meal. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew he was going to laugh with that, and we'll leave it, we'll leave it for next week, because it'll be fun. Huh. So anything else you want to make sure we talk about, Seijin, before we, we send this one away? No, no, man. Okay. Uh, well, I guess one other thing, just because it's out there, and if you are a Nintendo Switch Online, try it. Uh, F zero ninety nine. Yeah, we didn't talk about. We didn't the talk about it at all. at all, but we will probably talk about it more because it's only been available for about five days, uh, yeah. and I I'm a little salty about it because of Super Mario thirty five, but it's having a moment right now. So F zero ninety nine is out there. I know I'm going to put some time in. Season's going to put some time in, and we'll. Uh, I think we'll talk a little bit more about it next week. Yeah. Um, but that, if you have anything you'd like to get in touch with us, suggestions for the meal I prepare for Seijin, uh, you can find us. Uh, best way right now is email, uh, the say report at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to start that dialogue. And if it's a specific thing for Seijin or myself, just make sure you denote that in the subject line, and it will get to the proper party. Um, with that, thank you to everyone who listened and joined us for the return of the rolled chicken taco. And now, William, please bring us home. Thank you for listening to the Say Report with your host Devin Decker and Seaton Serwick. Please follow the guys on Twitter and Facebook by searching for The Say Report. And you can always subscribe on your podcast channel so this is delivered straight to you and you can enjoy it every week. With apologies to your mother, we'll see you next time.